everybody. I'm Chris Carberry, CEO of Explore Mars. Welcome to the Humans to Mars series, webinar series. Today's webinar is called Designing Mars, Form and Function for Living on Mars. But before we start our webinar, just a few quick announcements. First of all, we will be taking a couple weeks off after this webinar, but we'll be coming back after the 4th of July here in the United States um, to have a panel, special panel called um, Committing to Diversity and Ensuring Equality, How Learning from Our Past Enables the Future on Mars. That will be moderated by Dr. Cyan Proctor. So that'll be a really exciting uh, session. Uh, I'd also like to thank our Sp Humans to Mars Summit sponsors, including Aerojet Rocketdyne, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, ULA, Paragon, and many others who will be mentioning you know, throughout this webinar series. We hope you'll check out for all of our programming our website at exploremars.org or sign up for our newsletter to get posts on all of our upcoming programming. Um, also, if you've enjoyed these programs, we hope you'll support us. And thank you for everybody who's donated to come on this webinar. But we certainly appreciate your support. If you would like to sponsor the webinar series or the upcoming Humans to Mars Summit, please let us know. E email us at info at exploremars.org. So I think it's time to move on to our session, uh, Designing Mars. And moderating our session today is Beth Mund, host of the podcast Casual Space. So welcome, Beth. Hi, Chris. Hi, panelists. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you for this webinar series, which is so fantastic. And I'm a big fan and I'm honored to host. And I myself am a space communication evangelist. I love telling the stories and capturing the narratives of these women today and the fine folks who help us explore space. So let's get started. I would love to introduce you to the panelists, if I may. Thank you, Chris. We're going to go ahead and I'd like to start with Vera Muliani. She is the CEO and founder of Mars City Design. She has created this innovative platform to make the vision to live on Mars closer to reality and making space more creatively inclusive. She's a visionary leader with multidisciplinary skills in conceptual art and entrepreneurship. Muliani's concepts of architecture and urbanism advocates a self-sustaining, environmentally responsible approach. She is recognized as a pioneer in advocacy the importance of human wellness centered design in space technology. Her Mars architecture design method is thriving beyond just surviving. Vera's Alpha team was selected in the top 10 projects of NASA 3D printed Habitat Centennial Challenge. Congratulations! Today, Mars City is building the prototypes in the Mojave Desert, California, and in her free time, Vera likes to create some Martian menus, designing a Let's Pack for Mars shop. She's also working on some artistic experiments to be sent to the International Space Station National Laboratory. Vera, it is so great to have you. Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you all for being here with us. Um, thank you, Explore Mars team, for your energy to keep having incredible conferences, events online, and for having me today, as well as yesterday, many, many months and years ago. I consider you my dear Martian family. So thank you for that. Um, I will share now the slides. You could see this. Okay. So, yeah, I founded Mars City Design five years ago. It's an innovative platform to explore the concept of livability and sustainability on Mars. I named it uh, Mars Architecture. So we're working on building some test prototypes here on Earth and hopefully on the moon, of course, that would be before Mars, if we're all still alive. <laughs> so uh, we started with hosting some educational activities such as annual design competitions, exhibitions, and workshops. 
So participants come from around the world with a variety of backgrounds, from art, design, to aerospace engineering, to social sciences, uh, we were published and exhibited by the NASA Johnson Space Center last year, at the Design Museum in London, and then the Discovery Channel that reached to 90 million people in the world. Every year in our competition program, we highlight different focuses. So last year was about sport on Mars. We were using um, the problem of one-third gravity to reinvent our existing sport games. Uh, by the way, the slide before, you can actually look at all the results of this very innovative designs from all over the world on our website, uh, Hall of Fame, from years uh, of 2016 to 2020. Uh, this year is about growing our food, uh, relevant to our COVID-19 timing. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, being isolated indoors, we wonder what kind of food we need for our immune systems in an extreme environment scenario. So we have the support from National Geographic's uh, SIMOC for the team's greenhouse design simulation. It has been really fun to experiment, you know, uh, understand how we uh, design the surface, if it's um, correspondent to our survivability. Um, and so today we're developing our own physical research center in the Mojave Desert. We are providing some consulting services to help companies, either startups or corporates who seek to co-brand with space or to rebrand to be qualified in the sustainability program. We have access to the UN and the NASA Space Act Agreement if necessary for those companies. Uh, we select and promote those within the category of clean energy, smart transportation, AI technology, food growing, waste management, all of that that are needed to build a functioning city for an extreme environment. We are also forming a workshop with, um, sorry, this is uh, the nation. We're also forming a workshop with uh, NASA to tackle the question around human living location choices on Mars to then build the dislocation simulation that will be suitable for testing the technology. Uh, so space companies can then lease these facilities to test their prototypes. That is our future products. Uh, so overall, we're working on eight different projects at the moment. Each one is essential for what it takes to build an emotionally intelligent city. Each project has its own commercial plan that will be very profitable, not just financially for our investors, but also for humanity and the environment. So I'd like to invite you to join forces in creating the path to Mars safely, but also considerably and creatively. To end, uh, we're definitely an inclusive organization, not just racially, as you can see, but creatively and socially. With what happened in society lately, I realized that I am under the category of a minority woman leader trying to be the voice of those who are considered not fitting in the space industry, which sometimes still pays for myself. But deep inside, I have been simply a Martian, just like you all. So I look forward to connecting with you. Wonderful, Vera. Thank you so much. And may I remind everyone and introduce to everyone this fantastic panel of female architects and talents. It's just terrific to have you. I want to ask you a quick question before we move into our next panelist. You said you have an emotionally, emotional intelligent city. What is that? Yeah, I think it's time for us to um, create a functioning environment where we live in based on not just economy or greed because right. that doesn't really um it's not sustainable for a long term as we could see the results uh today in terms of damaging 
nature damaging our psychology and all the pollutions happening and uh, yeah there's a lot of research about that fantastic thank you wow fantastic okay all right we have two more panelists i want to introduce you next to Anastasia Procina. She's the founder and CEO of Stellar Amenities. And then after Anastasia, I will introduce you to Michal Ziesel. Hi, ladies. Here we go. Let me first introduce you to Anastasia. And at the end, we will have 15 minutes for questions. So I'm excited to get to those questions. So keep them coming in the Q&A down on the side or at the link that's been provided. Anastasia Procina is an award-winning aspirational futurist and practitioner, practitioner in space architecture, the nascent field of helping people thrive in small spaces in outer space. She is the founder and the CEO of Stellar Amenities, a company with the mission of completing space habitats with lightweight, com excuse me, lightweight, deployable, and reconfigurable elements to support well-being in space. Anastasia has been involved in numerous space projects from designing lightweight interior habitation structures for the Tesseray self-assembling space station at MIT Media Lab Space Exploration Initiative whew, to working on an Iceland-based Martian analog habitat commissioned by the Mars Society. Her other places of work include aerospace company Excalibur Almez, Fourth Planet Logistics, and Galactica Space. Anastasia has spoken publicly around the U.S. about space architecture, and she's written three papers on the subject matter, including a co-authorship with the former deputy of NASA, Deputy Administrator Dava Newman. Anastasia holds Master's in Space Architecture from Sasakawa International Center for Space Architecture in proximity and collaboration of NASA Johnson Space Center, my alma mater, in Houston. Anastasia received a Bachelor's in Urban Design from Novosibirsk. Did I say that right, Anastasia? State oh, University? Um, Novosibirsk? I was close. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. Um, State University of Architecture, Design, and Art. Anastasia, it's so nice to have you. Thank you very so much. I'm so honored to be with you all. Uh, thank you, uh, Explore Mars, for having me. I'm so fascinated by joining uh, fascinating women in the space exploration, uh, particularly in particular in space architecture. And um, let me uh, just start sharing my screen. Okay, well, Anastasia gets prepared and gets her screen set. Again, I want to invite you to check out not only exploremars.org, but as we're going to get today, you can send any questions into the Q&A link provided. And if at the end we don't get to your question, that's okay. We'll be definitely sending your questions to the panelists directly. And if possible, they'll reach back out to you um, on their personal channels and be able to answer your questions. All right, you're back. Uh, yeah, so could you see my can you see my slides now? We can see you. Oh, one let's second. see. Yeah. Um, since I'm from iPad, it's really um, oh, one second. Uh, yeah. Can you uh, please assist me in sharing my slides? Yes, ma'am. I will begin that now. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. You are good to go, Ms. Thank Anastasia. Thank you so much. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, thank you again, Beth, for introducing me. I am Anastasia Persina. I am a founder and CEO of Storamentis. Storamentis, we design highly functional and profitable places in small spaces from Earth to Mars and everywhere between. It's uh, the reason why we design, why we have this broad perspective 
design is because I believe that if you design a comfortable space, um, uh, like a small space, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, you know, on Earth or in orbit, in low, low Earth orbit or on Mars. And um, so the company's mission is to lower behavior health risk and boost the crew's productivity to enable the multiplanetary future of humanity. Uh, can we go next slide, please? Oh, well, <laughs> it's a bit, um, yeah. So um, uh, as you can see, there is so many things going on in, in space currently. Uh, we have uh, SpaceX, the very first, the historic uh, SpaceX crew um, launch um, just the end of the May. And it was just fascinating. It marks the new era of exploration. And it's especially for our space architect, it just brings a lot of joy re realizing that it's, it's so much close for inhabiting our solar system. And uh, it's actually where we can put our hands and work together. Can I go next slide, please? Yeah. Uh, so this is how Space Habitats uh, looks right now. And uh, can, can you click, please? Um, and it's a very utilitarian design. No one wants to live in this environment. Um, and I just can say that this three habitats they were designed by engineers yet it takes more than an engineer to design successful uh, spacecraft and it takes more than an engineer to design a uh, spacecraft that gets people want to go to space people want to go to space there is no doubt about that but what we can uh, what we, we don't see that people actually buying tickets to space uh, no expect for a handful very wealthy which some people might say to be expected. But this is not the entire truth. It takes more than wealth to go to space. It's actually, it takes more, it takes people to really want to go to space. And this is uh, the reason why I created the company. It's um, um, to provide this vision of how, how much fun and what our activities can be invented in the weightlessness as well as the different gravities. Can you go to the next slide, please? This is the chart, uh, just the kind of showcase how many people been to um, LEO, been to a low Earth orbit. It's just seven out of uh, people, like 55, uh, almost 56,000 people that can afford to go to space right now. And uh, can you go to the next slide, please? This is uh, the reason why it's because it takes uh, more than, I said, I said before, it takes more than an engineer to design successful space job. And there's so much uh, invented things, uh, I mean, things um, are waiting to be invented in space. And there is uh, just, you know, floating spa and multimedia projections that we have to one's moment. Can you imagine that? I'll go next slide. Um, and also, uh, of course, when we're talking about crew admission to Mars, obviously everybody, uh, the first people that step on Mars are going to be astronauts. Uh, human access to space entails numerous risks, especially on long duration missions like trip to Mars. Crew chosen for these adventures, yet historical mission will struggle with the limits of their living in communal spaces, which can increase the chance of conflict between participants. Challenges of being isolated can be mitigated by applying tactile textile, um, uh, sorry, tactile textures, uh, warm colors uh, of interior, and ever-changing spaces that break down the monoton monotony of everyday uh, life. Can you go to the next slide, please? So what we do is we provide sensory stimuli to our interior design. And we thinking we break down the all experiences that have ever been done in space, not only in space but on Earth, where our games been, you know, what kind of games we have on Earth, and then how it can be translated to the different experience and the benefits of gravity. Um, can you go to the next slide, please. 
So uh, talking about Starmint, yes, we provide a variety of services. Um, specifically, we focus on a habitation design consultation for space companies. Um, and also we collaborate with filmmakers and do outreach activities to promote the nascent field of space architecture. And this is uh, our mission to show how humanity is going to thrive in space. Next. Um, this is the project that we worked. This is just, uh, just a few projects we ever be uh, lucky to work on. Um, so the Iceland Analog Habitat, my, uh, pro, um, I was working with Mars Society and Post Plant Logistics. It's a deployable inflatable habitat that's been placed in lava tube in Iceland um, as a fourth um, habitat that's been used by Mars, uh, sorry, by Mars, ha, uh, Mars Society for training the um, analog astronauts. And then the second project you see that this is project that we've been working with Excalibur Mass. It's a human ba um, Houston based uh, company that basically uh, the client came uh, to me and uh, other students at space architecture program and saying that this is, I have a shell of a Soviet space raft and I need to create an interior of that. It was so much fascinating by that. And uh, the most challenging uh, a thing was is to combine two different users so this um, station was designed for um, astronauts as well as for tourists and then but they used it in different times so how you combine these different extremely different users the same place so how you change environment uh, sort of thing so there is more project um, pictures on the website uh, i will provide more links in the end of this um, presentation and then I worked with them, my team in Dila was really fascinated by working with them. So basically I was uh, challenged to complement the self-assembling space station made of a Bucky, kind of uh, inspired by Bucky Fuller design. So I was working complementing um, interior design with the high, um, high lightweight, not just lightweight uh, um, structures. To support well being in space. So, in the picture, you see there is, uh, there is a girl doing yoga. So, why not, you know? And then, um, my chief technology officer, Stalarmen, is uh, he is an uh, employee of NASA. He is uh, um, the reason why he is our chief technology officer is because he is an origami master. He knows the math behind it and he knows how to create lightweight structures. Uh, that really stalls in space and deploys like many, many times bigger than its uh, previous size. And it's so much important in space exploration to keep weight as less as possible. So you decrease the price. And the next project is I was working um, two years ago, I can imagine. So this futuristic uh, uh, concert hall uh, that I was working in Hong Kong. And then um, the last project is uh, been done the very first project that been done was Tormentis. I founded this company um, in December last uh, December 2019. So this project is uh, uh, kind of explores the way how we will see them, uh, in Martian gravity and explores the ways what's the most com comfortable uh, taking into account uh, the way we see it uh, and decrease the, uh, decrease gravity. Next slide, please. So I, yes, uh, uh, you can go next slide. So I spoke uh, around the globe, not only in the US, um, and uh, the, that's really great that people get really so much inspiration by space architecture. And on that, I decided to cre create, to host um, talks uh, on space architecture where I invite extremely different uh, and multi multidisciplinary team uh, of a uh, uh, group of people. Um, this is serious takes a creative spin of a future living space, bringing together a diverse range of speakers, space architects, Hollywood, visionaries, sci-fi writers, designers, and more. And uh, you can learn more about it um, on the website. I'm going to find the next slide. So stay connected. If you have any questions, please uh, 
email us at hello at stellarmentis.space and thank you so much it took me a little bit longer than expected <laughs> yeah thank you so thank much you. thank anastasia, you anastasia thank you so much i love i want to ask your Iceland analog habitat is very impressive. I think that's something we could use in this cold Chicago winter. <laughs> and oh. also, although I'd like to be inside at your floating spa. That sounds very appealing to me. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we'll talk more about your design of small spaces with some questions coming up. But first, I'd like to introduce our next panelist. All right. Mikael Ziesel is the founder of Ziesel, a studio working at the intersection of architecture, innovation, space, and human equality based in Tel Aviv. And she's the founder of the social space venture, Mars is More. She is also a space architect focused on human experience, a trailblazer by dealing with social and Psychology, psychological diversity aspects. A visionary architect who practices for almost, it's been a decade in Israel and New York City, Michael has extensive experience in skyscrapers and large scale urban projects. A graduate of the Technion, Israel's Institute of Technology, she also served in the elite Israel Defense Force Intelligent Unit 8200. Wow. Taken together, Michael brings a combination of creative skills, intelligence data analysis, and technical abilities used to manifest into a space architect. She's a two-time TEDx speaker, and I highly recommend you listen to her TED Talks. The first one by TED International Space University and TED Jaffa Women, a lecturer at various universities, organizations, and creative tech companies with a mission to create a built environment fitting to its diverse users, ensuring not only the survival, but the thrival of humanity as a whole. Michelle is actively raising awareness for gender and human equality through work with international organizations such as Global Citizen and the UN. Her studio, Zizel, was chosen to be part of the 10, the top 10 global initiatives fighting for gender equality by the UN SDG Action Campaign of 2019. Congratulations. A proud activist and avid traveler, Michelle is inspired by cultures, diversity, and the various ways people use space on earth and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, our third panelist today, it is so wonderful that you're joining us, Michael Ziesel. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to be here among these amazing women that it's, uh, it's interesting to see how Mars, um, Mars is named after Aries, the god of war, and it's dominated by uh, uh, women space architects, and I love to be a part of it. So this is very exciting to me, and I'll quickly share my slides. One second. Let's see if you can see it. Okay. So, um, as Beth kindly introduced me, um, my name is Michal Ziso. Uh, outside of Israel, I go by Mika, so feel free. Um, I'm many, many things. I'm an architect, an entrepreneur, and a visionary, and public speaker, and creative thinker, and thought leader and also a space architect. Um, these are some of my uh, projects on Earth. I divide my time between half my week is with gravity architecture and the other half of the week is without gravity architecture. So on the left, you see a skyscraper. I was part of the team uh, designing in Tel Aviv, Israel. It's a residential tower um, of very, very beautiful apartments right on the seashore. And on the on, that was on the left and on the right side, you see, um, uh, the skyline of New York City. Uh, you see a very, very preliminary des uh, design of a skyscraper, an 80-story skyscraper right on Fifth Avenue and 44th Street. Um, this is just uh, a location of where it's uh, going to be built. I was part of the um, concept design team. Uh, and here you can also see two other projects. One of them is on 34th Street, uh, right across from Medicine Square Garden. And is this um, box of um, four floors of retail space. Right now, everything is closed down in New York City. I'm not sure what's going to happen with this, but it is under construction. And on the right, you see 
a, a smaller project. Uh, I went from uh, down by scale. Uh, this is a project I did in uh, Australia for designing a vacation house out of, made out of containers, uh, shipping containers. So this is kind of a taste of my work on Earth of the with gravity. Um, and my journey kind of um, into space began when I understood that everything around us uh, may not be designed necessarily for us. And probably if things were to, design, to be designed for each and every one of our needs specifically, maybe we'll be able to have not only better life, we'll have safer lives, and maybe we'll also be more efficient um, in the way we live our lives, because after all, we don't have much time here on the blue planet. Um, so it's better for us to uh, take the best advantage of it. And these two images kind of represent it for me because on the left you see the Vitruvian Man by Leonardo da Vinci and on the right you see uh, the Modulo, which is uh, by Le Corbusier, a very, very famous architect in the 50s. And they both uh, depicted what um, proportions architects should use when they are designing um, <clears throat> our built environment. And they are both, as you can see, are by proportions of not only men, but very, very tall and muscular men. And until today, a lot of architects are using pretty much that kind of um, uh, baseline of proportions, uh, which creates issues of, uh, actually as a name, it's called discrimination by design, that not only, not everything is fitting for us, and it's the same goes for cities, buildings, um, neighborhoods, and also products, uh, it's also, um, may lead to actual discrimination that we will not be able to use certain things in a certain way and live our life equally. Um, so that kind of led me into uh, the space industry in a way that I decided that I wanted to create an equality driven architecture uh, settlement on Mars. Um, after a lot of thought, it looked like this. This, this was part of um, an international architecture competition a few years back um, that I decided to create architecture um, in these uh, ring or donut shapes because I realize that they are very, very equal or equal equality promoting. Think about the way we sit around a campfire or sit around a table. Every person gets a share or uh, uh, an equal piece. Uh, it's also very safe. It's easier to protect from danger. You can see today uh, Milan, Paris, a lot of uh, European cities are uh, were planned in these circular manner. Their, their, uh, their walls are are kind of circles around the actual city. And also we can uh, place the public functions in the center and live the, the private residential areas all around it. Uh, in that way, we are able to um, kind of see always what's going on inside. Uh, and another bonus of this kind of architecture is that there are no dead ends at all. So nobody is stuck in a dead end uh, uh, feeling unsafe or scared. Uh, this is another image of that um, that idea, the idea was to um, have uh, a fractal quality, which means that that circle works uh, as a small house. It can also grow and become a neighborhood. And if you put a lot of them together, it can, it, it can become a city. Uh, so that was that idea. Um, today, I'm researching a lot um, the, the ways things are happening on Earth. I realize that we have a very fast moving world and a very slow moving architecture. Uh, it is very hard for us, since I do uh, large-scale projects, skyscrapers, um, we usually begin to plan 10 years before it's actually realized and built. And sometimes a lot of things happen, look at us now, a lot of things happen in the middle of those 10 years, and uh, the, final, the, the finished product is not fitting uh, for our needs anymore. So I think that, for me, space and Mars is kind of a way to design for the future. Uh, of Earth. Um, it can also be a, 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 a design and work that is may in the future actually happen, but it's also helping me to envision what the world on Earth here uh, is going to look like. And I do that all the time by thinking about um, the diversity of people, spaces for everyone, uh, not only for the people who work in the space industry. And my mission is to, um, to design with them in mind for women, men, different cultures, different uh, backgrounds, different um, um, uh, needs, different abilities. Uh, I think that a lot of people on earth that are living with maybe disabilities, they will discover that they have superpowers uh, in space. And I think that that's something that is very interesting to explore. And if they have superpowers in, in, in space, why don't they have superpowers here 
and why don't we use those unique um, abilities um, to benefit everyone? Um, I also think if, if you see this image, then um, I think every person, as we grow into a more dense um, um, cities and more overpopulated cities, and as uh, Anastasia mentioned, in space, we're also working about uh, working on very, very small, compact uh, spaces because uh, we have to artificially create artificial environments and it's very expensive, so we are keeping it small. Uh, different people have different ideas of how personal space or what kind of personal space feels comfortable for them. So some people are comfortable with people being very, very close to them, and some people prefer a few, uh, uh, a few meters or they prefer a few, uh, a certain amount of distance away. Uh, and that's also something that I take into consideration. Um, a few things that are happening here on Earth that we already are facing in space today is we are living in the co-generation, uh, co-living, co-working, co-transportation. Uh, and in space, that's exactly what we're dealing with right now in the artificial habitat. So if we will be able to create and design those uh, uh, co-living uh, habitats uh, in a very, very efficient way, we'll be able to bring those ideas back here to Earth. Um, the second thing is, as uh, Anastasia also showed it, um, we are living in the information era. Uh, we are, um, our cities, uh, the places we live in, are very, very uh, packed visually. And when we think about space, we usually think about something that looks like the picture on the left, but the reality is that the International Space Station looks like the picture on the right. And part of it is due to the fact that it was designed by engineers and not architects. Um, I think that not only uh, um, it can look different, but this has a very, very um, great effect on the ability of the astronauts to function. Um, so I think that's something that we are dealing uh, with here on Earth. A lot of, we see it in the young kids, that they are having trouble concentrating because everything is interrupting them uh, visually. And we will be uh, forced or will be going towards a future that will have to think about those things uh, on Earth. And it's already something that we have to think about in space. The last thing I thought of was oxygen. In space, we don't have oxygen. And here on Earth, we have a lot of countries and cities that are very, very polluted. We see Asia, they have some, some uh, cities in Asia have uh, oxygen uh, rooms in, on the streets. Uh, the people can breathe cleaner air. Uh, and it's something that we're um, um, going to face uh, as long as we go. And if we have solutions for that in space, we'll be able to implement them on Earth. Um, as Beth mentioned, I gave two TEDx talks, one in Israel that was focused on the equality uh, part uh, of what I do. And the other one was uh, in the International Space University in, in France um, that I talked about um, the whole uh, idea of new space and how the, the power is in the hands of more people today in private companies as opposed to governments uh, and how we should really learn from mistakes that were made on earth and not do them again when we design um, for space. And the last thing I wanted to share um, real quick is that recently I've been, especially uh, during this time of uh, the pandemic, I've been working a lot with um, the UN SDG uh, action campaign and the Space for Women for uh, UNOSA, which is the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. I've been working with the Ramon Foundation in Israel and the Israeli Space and Industry uh, Agency, I'm sorry, uh, and I've been working for uh, mentoring and, and um, encouraging young children and especially young women uh, to go into uh, STEM or STEAM as I like to uh, use it. The A goes for, uh, stands for arts uh, in STEAM, uh, STEAM uh, subjects and, and in universities and uh, eventually maybe get into the space industry and other tech industries. I think that is very important. I enjoy to do it very much. And the right, in the picture on the right, you see the, the man right here, he is the chief of the Israeli Space Agency. Uh, this is from a hackathon I was the mentor of and my team won first place. It was very exciting. Uh, so right now, this is what I'm doing. I'm working on a very um, secretive project in the Nevada desert that uh, will incorporate a lot of the um, ideas that I have for um, a habitat in space. Uh, I'm really excited about that, but I can't show it or talk about it that much. 
Um, and that was my presentation. And thank you so much for having me. Um, it's very, very exciting to be here. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Mikhail. Thank you. Wow, fantastic. None of you are busy at all. Nothing. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, I was, before we get to our questions, uh, we're doing great on timing. We have about three minutes before we're going to open it up to the many, many questions from all the folks all over the world who have tuned in, who are watching, and who have questions for you, talented architects. And I would like to start off with the first question, if I may. I'm so inspired, and it's so great that this is global and uh, universal right? And I wanted to ask each of you, if you could, start us off with how you got started in architecture and also why space and why you chose a type of architecture. I know, Anastasia, you mentioned specifically some small spaces. Uh, Michelle, you talk about big, very big spaces and large projects, large base projects. And all of you are interested in our future on Mars and leaving low Earth. And I have seen that International Space Station busyness. You know, things get lost in that all the time. And when I saw the, the picture you presented that just juxtaposed how clean and beautiful Beautiful. It could be, I'm sure any astronaut would sign up for that. That looked gorgeous. So let's start with you, Vera. Let's just quickly and briefly talk us through what, ins what inspired you, um, why the projects that you work on, and also why space? Yeah, so I'll start with architecture. I think uh, if I could call it a religion. <laughs> it's a practice that is very spiritual, actually, and it stimulates our creativity. I mean, my creativity, at least. And uh, it makes me able to see through uh, things that people would probably don't see. And that's like the magic joy uh, that I could experience every single moment when I have um, the chance to uh, see, uh, you know, beauty in our nature. And so I already noticed that since I was a kid. Um, and as so many of you probably know, I, I grew up in Indonesia and it's not, it, it's a third world country um, in the 80s. And uh, it was really hard to be a little girl in the slum area where everything just looks looked chaotic and um, somehow I was able to appreciate different beauty that are hidden a little bit everywhere so it was like finding treasures uh, so when I was able to move to France and got accepted in architecture school I got my master's degree I went to New York I just looked at my journey and realized like this is how life should be like the thriving issue is actually the the answers for skipping survival method so the design that we create becomes you know surpassing uh, and becomes innovation instead of just reactional uh, action and what's interesting with space is that um, you know it's beyond uh, just technology I think I, I really believe this is my personal um, you know uh, believe I, I think that propulsion solution for transportation to space is not the ultimate answer yet I think we have to find a way to get to Mars faster and safer, safer and um, also way more comfortable and um, more affordable. So it's like when human invented cars and the horse just become obsolete and uh, it's not like, I think that's the way I see how architecture could, um, you know, contribute in the in the space industry. So we we come up with 
it seems like we come up with more problems uh, because everyone would say like, why it's already so expensive to design uh, transportation for space. Um, but maybe because we add more vision towards uh, the thriving future, we just find that moment of click where everything else we have created so far will be completely obsolete and we'll have the answer to to that yeah we definitely need to work on our propulsion systems and hopefully we can get places faster so we can start building uh anastasia thank you vera let's talk really briefly about how you got started and why small spaces was a draw for you and ultimately outer space Thank you so much for this question. This is a um, very important question to ask, um, not only me, but everybody, why you do what you're doing in your life. And uh, to me, it's, uh, uh, you know, small spaces. You know, living small is all about, uh, it's uh, versus, you know, there's a consumption culture that you buy a big house, you buy uh, items that you don't need in your life and then it's really uh, makes your life much more heavy and then you should take care of it and you spend all of your time doing it versus living small living minimalistic way and just having and owning things that you actually need this is really what drives me and this is i think that you know humanity in the space draft it's something that foster us as species. It's actually, you know, being in isolation as you, as we all experience it currently, being isolation, being so many unknown roads uh, to our inner self and uh, learning more about us uh, as a human, also about human nature and understanding our needs. And um, so this is, uh, really what inspires me and uh, how I actually got into it. It's really good to ask question. I was an architect, um, um, kind of specifically urban planner, urban designer. I was studying urban design in Siberia. It's a part of Russia, one of the coldest places of, uh, of Earth. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's why I hate winters. I mean, I just feel like I wasn't supposed to board in a so, so much cold place. Now I live in California, really enjoying it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so I was studying architecture in the third year. I, I always, you know, I always explore some different exhibitions in art and sculpture. I, I've been an artist since I was seven. So I really always exploring what's, you know, different things I could explore in the, in the world. And then I went to this exhibition of a very first space architect uh, Soviet uh, program. Her name is Galina Blashova. It's the first and the only pro, um, space architect. And uh, uh, coincidentally, she's, she's a woman. So she designed all the interiors for uh, Soviet uh, space routes. And it was so much fascinating because she thought about bringing Earth to the small capsule of you know, of a space capsule and uh, kind of uh, differentiating uh, the ceiling and differentiating the uh, floor. Uh, so the floor become grass, you know, it's green. So she, she applied different colors, different uh, areas. So she can, you can feel that you are your actual home. Whereas we all know that in space, there's no ceiling there's like whatever all the space for you you just create whatever you want right so she was doing it and then i was really fascinated by the integration of a human body into a small space raft and how this shell becomes a kind of a second body of human because human you can, a human cannot survive without the shell and this shell actually keeps uh, it's kind of a womb so you are fet fetus in a womb and then you cannot survive without your mother fetus uh, well, I mean, and uh, so in this I, kind of philosophy thing, I was thinking, wow, this is so great. You know, doing more is less uh, in a tiny capsule and bringing us 
closer to the future of all I guess everybody is dreaming of is like exploring our universe, exploring our mind, what why we are here, you know, like I also have had this existential crisis when I was very small, maybe like ten or something, and I was questioning myself why everything is for you know, why why what what could I do about it? So this is actually maybe it's the reason why I'm doing space architecture, because this is the only one thing I can work on. This is this is challenging. This is, uh, you know, ex uh, helps us explore because uh, without space architecture, we can't survive. Mm -hmm. um, especially, I uh, just want to mention that, especially, you know, um, we all been in isolation for a few months due to coronavirus, mm -hmm. and we know all the struggle being in the same space and uh, getting really bored. And our days, <laughs> we don't, we cannot really build any memories because being in one space just doesn't make any, you know, uh, kind of triggers, doesn't provide any triggers for us. And uh, uh, when you're thinking about Mars mission gonna take around three years and being in, almost in one space without, almost without leaving your habitat, being with the same people who are not your family. And then you can actually, think that there's going to be so much rising conflicts and uh, and it means that if you have conflicts in your team the team is not working well enough and then it breaks the whole mission can be you know failed and it unfortunately can lead to a death of somebody so I have this uh, philosophy that space architecture how, uh, can eliminate this by applying um, you know, uh, color, different color palettes, different uh, tactile experience, and uh, ever-changing places. So it can uh, boost mood of crew and uh, hence lead it to successful mission and hence uh, to the mm -hmm. multiplanetary uh, future of us as humanity. So. Wow. <laughs> Anastasia, that is so true. You know, I didn't even think that it's just a direct correlation with how small of a space we'll be traveling through when we go to space, when we go to Mars and other places. And what we're all experiencing right now, which is the frustration and the challenges of our current environment. Many, for many, it is very small. That's fantastic. What a great perspective. I want to thank you so much because I know as we're nearing the top of the hour that you will need to have your heart stop. And we thank you so much for joining us. I want uh, everyone to make second. sure they... I, Go yeah, ahead. I am actually, I can stay with you longer. because. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. So before I move, thank you, Anastasia. I'm so glad you're going to sure, stay for a little you. while longer. Good. We've got a ton of questions. Let me get one specifically to Michal because this one, I know you can also please chime in on and all of uh, the architects, please just jump right in as we continue to share the conversation. Uh, small versus big versus space and what inspired you. And ask Mikhail as you answer that, please also answer this question that came in from Taposwini Sharma, who wants to know how gravity will be affecting our designs on Mars. Great question. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, well, my journey into architecture was... Um was very intuitive. I grew up, part of my childhood, I grew up in uh, New York City and I was there with my whole family and they used to take my brother and I to uh, trips across the country. And whenever they, my parents took us to amazing parks in the Grand Canyon and a lot of deserts and it was amazing. I always told my parents as a very young child um, that that's not exciting for me and please take me to see a city. Um, and that was kind of something that I used to tell them when I was really <laughs> young that I didn't know that architecture was even a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I was always attracted to, to um, cities and urban areas and urban places and the busyness of the streets. And that's also very inspiring, inspiring for me until this day. Whenever I want to be creative, I go and sit uh, in a, a cafe on the street around everyone. So um, that's until today, very inspiring for me. And um, after I uh, finished my military service at the uh, intelligence unit, um, 8200 in Israel, um, I went to Thailand and I was there for a few months and I was sitting on the beach and I thought that 
I wish there was a, a, an occupation that could combine both sides of my brain, combine the technical things that I did in the military and to combine uh, the creative things that I, I love to do and think. Um, and then it hit me that architecture was it. So, uh, and from there, when I decided to uh, go with skyscrapers, it was because um, I love to solve puzzles and I just looked for the biggest puzzles I could find, which were skyscrapers. Um, and that's kind of why I went into that and, and I love doing that. And I also realized that a lot of times when you know how to create big, it's easier to create small uh, instead of uh, going from small to big. Um, so that was also um, uh, another reason why I went uh, to specialize in that. Um, and my way into space architecture, I was never uh, a big sci-fi person, but once I started to uh, look around with open eyes about our built environment on Earth, and I realized, Vera mentioned the horse, um, a lot of uh, places around the world, the, the dimension of a street, the width of a street, is by the width of a carriage, which is by the width of two butts of horses, and that's kind of the width we got stuck with. The reason that um, we have uh, the, our keyboards with the, word, the letters all uh, not in, in alphabetical order is because when they were printing machines, people printed too fast and the hooks got uh, hit together and, and, and they had to make the letters not in, a, in the order so people would type slower and we kind of ah. got stuck with it. So ah. a lot of people around us in the world, if it's products and if it's buildings and if it's city and urban planning, happen for reasons that we, or for, to solve problems that we don't have anymore and we kind of got stuck with the solutions and it's really, really hard to change it now because it's big infrastructure or it's habits that we have as a culture for many, many, many years. And for me, space is the way Elon Musk is, ta is calling it um, reasoning from first principles. So it's kind of like looking at the, the, the problems we have at hand and, and not being influenced from what we know from our past and try to look at things and look at the problems we have right now and, and kind of stay away from things that are a force of habit. Um, so that's kind of why I got into the space industry because it's just very, um, it's, it's, a, it's a good clean, for me, clean canvas or clean, clean platform to think about how things should be right now in the time we're living in with the technology we have, uh, with the equality for most people, hopefully for all people soon uh, that we have. Um, so that's kind of why. And also, it's a very interesting thing when you, I talk about equality on Earth. It's one thing, it's a heavy topic, people don't like to talk about it, but when I talk about it in the future and space, it's something that people really enjoy discussing because it's not on them. It's something that is imaginative, it's something that's in the future, it's something that we can right. dream about. And it's a very uh, good tool to talk about a lot of difficult subjects right. that we have here on Earth. So that's why um, uh, I went into the space industry and I think the people that are in the space industry are the most, um, creative and optimistic people I've ever met in my entire life. So it's really good. Once I found them, I don't want to move. Uh, <laughs> to exactly. I totally agree. Like, you know, space folks, the most optimistic. And so I think it should be like, especially space positive entrepreneurs, optimistic. Yeah. Uh, and but. for the question of Tapa Sweeney, I think that was the name, uh, about the gravity in, a, in, a, uh, in space. So every, um, we can design for the International Space Station or spaceships, which are in microgravity. Uh, we can design for the moon, we can design for Mars, which has a, a third gravity, depends on what we're talking about. Um, but obviously, if we're thinking, for example, about the International Space Station when they're in microgravity, um, we really, like as An Anastasia mentioned, we don't have floor ceilings. Um, we can use the space, the whole volume of the space and not just where we walk on. Um, so that's a big thing. Uh, imagine how doors, if on earth doors are, are by the height of people uh, in space or in, on the International Space Station, it's by the, the width of people. People go like fly through them and don't, not walk uh, through them. So everything changes. On, on Mars, my project was, um, it, since it's third gravity, I, th I thought maybe people can jump higher. So from studying earth and I understood that uh, staircases and elevators are closed spaces that people don't really like to get stuck with strangers on. So I thought maybe if we could mm. do some, we could create um, 
machines that I call suction boosters and we'll place them on the ceilings. People can just jump and it can help them jump from floor to floor and prevent them from falling down. Um, and, oh, and we, like my kids would love that. We can use that <laughs> a lot of fun ways. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's something that is definitely makes everything um, different. It's, uh, it's very interesting to, to think about that. So good. I have another question that I'm seeing that's a bit repetitive throughout all the questions we're getting. And again, as we're, we're going to wrap up a little bit, but thank you everyone for participating and for joining us. Thank you to the panelists and thank you. You know, Michelle, you just mentioned that you found your people and your people live in a very optimistic future forward thinking place and your people along with exploremars.org, uh, which I want to send everyone to, it's their role, their mission to ask and invite everyone to have these difficult conversations, to come up with these plans that otherwise uh, can be sometimes very challenging for us. So we really want to thank our host, Explore Mars, for having us and having the ability to invite these dialogues, these conversations. So I'm going to move into what I think might be our final question. We'll see here. I'm going to try to get in a few more. But what I'm seeing throughout everyone's questions is a materials question. So we talked a little bit about gravity. Feel free to jump in here, everyone. This is a question for everyone. But there's questions about what kind of materials, um, materials that keep out radiation, materials that are based on bacteria. And if we get enough time, I really want, there's a number of people who have asked, as students, what they can study or a career path you'd recommend for them to get involved in space architecture. Go ahead, let's talk. Let's start with materials. Who would like to jump in and talk about maybe different kinds of materials that might be very, very much might be either in situ or that we might have to bring with? Go ahead. Yeah. I, um, so from the beginning, uh, you know, we, I, I keep using this uh, concept, like we're human and we will still be human when we go to Mars or when we live on Mars. So it's so important to keep the aspects of uh, what is good for human. We're coming from Earth and so many materials uh, that are actually very healing for us to have around us. And, uh, you know, everything from mineral water to salt, to many things that Mars has, uh, then we will have to adapt to what is local. So, so far, the research have been about, you know, how to treat ice rocks and uh, how to treat regolith, which is the Martian soil, uh, but also how to use challenges of nature of Mars, like radiations and uh, not enough oxygen to, I guess, crazy to say, have fun with when you design uh, the protection and safety for our habitat. So uh, yeah, that, that's the recipe to really uh, imagine, you know, first we look at what we have on earth that is good for us. And I love what Michal was saying earlier, how to, you know, really focus on um, what is available, but also what could be, not just what should be. Uh, that's, that's my uh, contribution. Uh, I can continue. So, um, okay, here, yeah. Um, I've been experimenting a lot with materials and there's so many uh, topic, uh, like, so many choices regarding that and uh, it really depends on what you want to achieve so for example if you're talking about new theory mars missions we probably will go with a typical cylinder module like yes i know it's boring but it's the way how the thing will go so first start from something simple and then we expand and then eventually we have a uh, mars city design provided by Mera. <laughs> so 
And uh, here is uh, when we're talking about this transition between this uh, small habitat, you know, the cre creativity of an architect could be applied only to the interior design, which we are basically focusing on Staramentis, in Staramentis. But then once we transition to in-situ resource utilization, once we have uh, this capacity of expansion, we could use regolith as a uh, main material, plus uh, if, you, if you all remember, we need to use binder for that. So the one of the proposals for binder could be uh, algae that stick together parts of uh, regolith we can clean uh, with that easily. And, uh, you know, stuff like that. But when we're talking about what goes inside of a habitat, you know, the radiation protection, there could be just a small shelter because we don't really need, um, you know, radiation protection for the whole time. And uh, the shelter could be d done with, uh, you know, algae plus water because algae, this is also a huge uh, resource of protein for it, for us. So we, we will consume it. I actually, I tried, I bought it a year ago, so I tried to think how Ashna is going to eat it and how it tastes like. It doesn't really taste good, but we will figure it out. So, and then by water, you know, creating uh, walls of water can protect mm -hmm. us from them radiation. Um, and since we need to what we need to have water anyway, so this is a really smart idea to my opinion, uh, using this multi functionality of materials. Well, obviously, when we're talking about interior design, it's uh, you know, no of gassing materials, so there's no gas or should be exposed, uh, uh, harmful gases exposed to people, and uh, you know, also lightweightness of materials. Uh, this is also one of the main factors because remember that space architecture is all about transportation. I'm talking about uh, when I'm men mentioning space architecture in this uh, term, I'm, I'm talking about. The architecture is going to happen next uh, decade or, you know, kind of upcoming. In this sense, we have, uh, you know, we strive for lightweightness, lightweightness, multifunctionality, and uh, uh, that everything can be assembled in a rocket. So, um, yeah, I would go for the second question. So, sure. if, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so please go mm -hmm. ahead on getting started. And Michal, if you have any um, that you want to, on materials that you want to weigh in on before we move to the next question. I think uh, mm -hmm. Anastasia covered and, and Vera covered uh, most of it. And I think maybe we should get a few more questions in. So I'll. Fantastic. I'll All right, well, let me be specific here because I want to make sure I give them credit. I want to make sure that you know who this question is coming from. This is how can students get involved in space architecture from Eden Wings? And this question is for everyone. This is, uh, I, I just, I'm gonna be a little short. This is uh, actually a good question because space architecture is said to be a fast growing industry by 2030. It's basically like as a professional. As well as a profession, we will be high demand in coming years. And advances in science and technology mean that architects will be required to design physical solutions to enable habitation of space on other planets. And moreover, space architects are considered the most aspirational roles from the list of jobs for the future, which is uh, really, you know, architect, architect, being architect itself, it's already amazing thing is like you can you have you are able to uh, you know use your imagination for all the good and then up and see things implemented physically this is the best that could be done i think to my opinion and then space architecture is just even better so uh getting back to the question so i i there's so many ways and i also i was questioning myself what could i do because after graduating from uh, urban planning urban design and urban planning school, I was thinking also how would I pave my way to space architecture. And I applied to masters uh, in Houston. There's, uh, you know, it's called the only world space architecture program. And I would say that this is really engineering program. It, it uh, provides you all the constraints of space flights. And also you have a almost daily meeting with astronauts and experts from NASA Joseph Space Center. 
it was extremely helpful. I'm so grateful for this experience. So this is the one place that I could study. And also, um, as I saw Vera mentioned in the comments that there is a Space Studies Institute in Europe. So you can also go for it and look uh, at it. And uh, well, you can be self-taught. I mean, if you would like to work with Stellar Mantis, for example, I, I don't really particularly pay attention on education. I particularly pay attention on skills and uh, motivation kind so I not, I don't consider uh, education as the you know the biggest part of your reason this is not really important uh, so this is my answer. okay thank you Anastasia let's okay. wrap with this question for students where they can find resources or classes I know we're sharing some of it in the chat room as well so Michael and Vera, if you'd like to share what you're thinking of for students who might be interested in space architecture, along with Anastasia's comments, then we'll kind of wrap up and then I'll showcase to everyone where they can find more information on this webinar series. Please go ahead. Michael, I'll let you answer. I already answered some of the lists on the chat room. Uh, I just wanna uh, also you know, highlight that it's so important before coming to architecture and space and then space architecture uh, background you come with something contributive like come with your specialty so that you can contribute to already complex uh, world of space and architecture otherwise uh, you can easily get lost so thank you uh, i would add that um i would build on what Vera said because it's really really important i think that in today's world, architecture is a very um, old profession. And today in the tech industry, um, I think the way you can shine is to take what you're good at, take what you know and combine it, combine it with what's important to you. And then you have a startup or you have an idea or you have a niche or you have uh, your unique uh, place that you can contribute. Um, so I think in architecture, to, to, to get involved in the space architecture, and I think that to study architecture is, is important um because it's such a big um um thing it's uh, there five years uh, uh is not even enough for for bachelor degree it's, it's not even enough to touch on everything that architecture um is about it's kind of it has a lot of power so i think um architects should use it carefully it's architecture is as i mentioned before is dictated by our social structure but it can also dictate how people behave uh in small uh, scale and in large scale so it's something that we, we should use very carefully. And, and in that sense, I believe that people should study architecture. But as for space uh, architecture, right now, um, and as Anastasia mentioned, there are not many places around the world. I think the International Space University uh, is very good. They have short-term programs. They have master's degrees. Um, they have uh, all kinds of <clears throat> programs that um, they uh, offer. Um, and for me specifically, um, it was when I became a space architect, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, when I, after I began to get interested in that and I started to get into the industry, I was introduced to Mr. Charles Bolden, who is the former NASA administrator and also an astronaut as a space architect. So once I was introduced to him as a space architect, I was kind of like, okay, so I'm a space architect then. And wow. I kind of rolled from, from there. I think it's something that you don't um, have the official training yet because it's so new. Um, so I think it's an opportunity to get uh, a foot in the door uh, more easily maybe. Um, and I think that the best way to, to be a space architect is, is to, to really um, be curious and to learn how to ask the questions and know the people and build your network. And it's, as I said, a lot of people are very, very happy to help um, to anyone so so feel free to reach out to me if you need uh, more specific advice and I completely <laughs> forgot uh, just to mention that I'm teaching a class um, in Loyola Marymount University here and uh, it, it could be online this time and uh, this is the first uh, Occupy Mars exploration and space uh, travel colonization um, class that we have so uh, you can register, look at uh, the LMU website. I can also
just send you the link uh, if you can email me on marscitydesign at gmail.com. Wow. Fantastic. Ladies and panelists, thank you so much. Um, we will be putting in all of this uh, information that you'll be able to find on the website because this is just one of many fantastic webinar series that Explore Mars hosts. In a moment, I'll turn it over to Chris, but personally, I am so inspired. I'm so excited by your mission of both diversity and inclusion and ex exploration that all is surrounded with architecture at its foundation. Vera, Anastasia, and Mikhail, thank you so much. Chris, tell us more about what's coming up well thank you Beth thank you everybody fantastic panel great topic I love hearing about this topic and how to approach design whereas you I think who forgot who mentioned it but of course everything we've looked at or have had for space architecture in the past has been by engineers and for good reason but now as you're really sure. beginning to explore beginning of thinking of doing creating human uh, civilization and space it's so exciting to see the architects really engaging and i have seen so many different architectural firms around the country beginning to look at this just five years ago you'd look at it and you wouldn't see the amount of interest but it's just really been a renaissance over the last several years so very exciting to see so at any rate thank you everybody for coming on as for our upcoming webinar series as i mentioned at the beginning of this session we will be taking the next couple weeks of weeks off for the uh independence day holiday in the united states but we'll be back be back a couple weeks after the fourth of july and we'll be doing a webinar uh regarding diversity and mars exploration the dr uh, Cyan proctor will moderate so we will send out information on that as soon as possible but we once again we hope you'll support us you know with you know it's not it's not inexpensive to run this series, so we'd appreciate anybody willing to support the organization by going to exploremars.org. So thank you again to everybody, uh, and I hope you have a really wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.